Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear your word. May it seek to illuminate your word to us. May we hear your words, may we follow them, and may we learn from them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture is from Acts 2, 36 to 32. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. phrase in the song says, and I carry it with me like a daddy did. I've got a name written and performed by Jim Croce. He carried his name like his daddy did? What could that mean? Well, guess what his daddy's name was? Jim Croce. Jim Croce as well. <laughs> so he was a junior. Um, he was named after his father in that song. He honored the memory of his father and was singing and saying in that song that he was proud of his father's name. His own name was the same as his dad's and that gave him his identity. He bore his father's name and when people called his name, he knew who he was. Now my question for you this morning is this. Do you know who you are? Do you know what name you bear? In Acts 2, 38, it says we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We bear the name of Jesus. That's why we are called Christians. And a Christian means a follower of Christ. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said that he was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he wrote that in 1 Corinthians 2, 2. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you belong to? Now you'd think that would be kind of a gimme. You'd think it would be obvious who we belong to. But too often people forget. Too often people take their eyes off of Jesus and turn their gaze to someone or something else and they attach themselves to that. And that was a problem even in the days of the early church. Paul wrote, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, inform me that they are, there's quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas, another name for Peter. Another says, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one of you could say you were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember baptizing anyone else. 
For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 17. In other words, some of the people of Corinth had taken their eyes off Jesus. They began to brag about who had baptized them into Christ. And Paul was saying, I'm glad I didn't get in the middle of all that. Yes, he baptized a few people there, but he usually left the baptism to someone else and focused on preaching. And that was a good thing, because then he wouldn't be put in an embarrassing position of upstaging Christ. Paul didn't die for the Corinthians. Jesus did. Recently, once a friend told me, you're in an Armenian. In other words, he was saying, I believe in religious teachings of a man named Jacobus Arminius, who maintained that men and women have a free will as opposed to teaching of Calvinism and essential other ones that said everything's predestined. Now, while it was probably true, I agreed with some of Arminius' thinking and doctrine. I responded, no, I'm not Arminian or whatever. I'm a Christian. Arminius didn't die for me, and while I may agree with some of his teachings, I don't belong to him, I belong to Christ, and that's all I want. So you see, once you're wrapped up in a moral teaching of someone else, remember it be Arminius, Luther, Calvin, etc., we might begin to want to defend that teacher against all people that would disagree and that's not really a good thing. The list of theologians and some of the thinkers like Thomas Campbell and Rockham John Smith were decent people, shared a common desire to return to scripture as the sole basis of what their doctrine was about and the authority in Christ's church. So agreeing with them, but they didn't die for me. I belong to Christ first and foremost and always. So we should be Christians only, right? In fact, that's why one of the models of a lot of churches today, we're not the only Christians, but we intend to be Christians only. <laughs> Our desire is that folks should know nothing more that we belong to Christ Jesus and that he was crucified for us. So theologically, that means we want to make Jesus and his book our sole authority. Acts 2.36 says, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. <coughs> Jesus has total authority as the Lord and the Christ. And his book, the Bible, tells us what he wants us to do. Only Christ, no book but the Bible. Essentially, that's saying our only real resource or authority is Jesus and his book. We strongly believe in the words of 2 Timothy, and that's the third chapter, 16 to 17, where it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may have complete equipment for every good work. Now, you would think most churches would buy into that, in practice, many of them don't, though. Too often churches feel they owe an allegiance to their creeds or their book of doctrine or their governing bodies. It's as if they place those creeds or those doctrines or authorities on top of Scripture and then filter God's word through those sources. Years ago, some men initiated something called One Body. It was an outreach of various denominational groups to see if we they could find some common ground in Scripture. Its objective was to just get people to talk with each other. They did that because they were confident that the Scripture <coughs> had the power to break down the barriers between different groups. So the format of the gathering was to have a couple of their men preach and then two of 
the people from whatever church they were meeting in or sanctuary they were at. Then they'd have a breakout session in the Sunday school classrooms where folks from their churches and folks from other would sit down and talk about things. Just to get to know each other and to understand the differences. But after a couple sessions, they began to notice their preachers would get up and read their notes verbatim, word for word. So in a breakout session, we asked what was going on. And one of them said, our preachers have to submit their sermons to headquarters first and make sure they conform to their doctrine. Now, to someone like me, that sounded kind of weird or bizarre. <laughs> uh, it apparently wasn't enough that the preachers <coughs> preached from Scripture. They had to toe the party line, you could say. By contrast, there was no one to tell the preachers of the other churches what that party line was. All our folks expected was them to rely on Jesus and his written word and that authority that was found there. As a result, the other preachers spoke more boldly and powerful from the heart. Now, this isn't just an issue with churches, though. Sometimes it's an issue with individual Christians. Their party line, you could say, is whatever popular preacher happens to be on TV or radio at the time. They don't examine the Bible for themselves much. Instead, they trust their favorite biblical authority without question, but they never, or at least rarely, study their Bible. And that's unfortunate and can be dangerous. Because no matter who your favorite authority is, sooner or later, that might be a recipe for disaster. By contrast, God commented, commended a group of people in the book of Acts who refused to accept Paul's preaching on face value. They were told, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Acts 17, 11. You see, God said these folks were noble because their authority was the Bible. Alex Trebek. <laughs> He was the host for the game show Jeopardy for years. And occasionally they let the studio audience ask questions about how things were handled behind the scenes. Apparently one of the most frequent questions asked was that he received, how many of the answers do you know? And Mr. Beck replied, all of them, because I have them in front of me. <laughs> That's the advantage that we have when we take Jesus at his word and trust the scriptures which are his written instructions for each of us. We have all the answers right in front of us in the Bible. If you say you believe in Jesus, but you don't trust the Bible, you're kind of fooling yourself. Because the only source of information that we have about who Jesus is and what his purpose or will for us is, is right there in the book. We don't have any other information other than Scripture. So one last thing, I only told you a portion of the motto that I mentioned earlier, the last part of that motto, it started out, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, but the rest of it said, no law but love, no law but love. You see, if we belong to Jesus, we'll obey his commands, and the most powerful command Jesus gave us was love one another. For he said that in John 15, 12, my command is this, love one another as I have loved you. So we are supposed to love one another, but some folks might be inclined to say, well, that means only people I have to love are one another's. One another's, or us the Christians. I don't have to love anybody else. I seriously <coughs> had a man in the first church I served tell me precisely that. He didn't have to love anyone.